uh, a lot of the debate has been about costs. So one of the things that's confusing, I think, for people who are reading the newspapers and trying to follow all of this is that you hear really radically different messages. When the um, Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office and the administration said that it was going to save a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. But just in the last uh, week or so, Representative Ryan, when he put together his, um, his alternative budget proposal, suggested that he could save um, 1.4 trillion, I think is the number, but a huge number, by repealing big sections of the Affordable Care Act. So I guess the, the question for all of you is, what's going on here? Um, and can you explain something about why people seem to be um, talking past each other about what this Affordable Care Act will cost and then later um, what it will do to health care costs more generally? I'll just, I'll just make one comment about this and let my, my, uh, the other panelists fill in. But, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't expand health insurance to 32 million people, that's money that the federal government is not spending. I mean, granted, the federal government's not paying 100% for all those people, but for the 16 million people that would be added to Medicaid alone, you're talking about the federal government paying 100% of their costs for the first, I don't know, several, three, four years, something like that. Um, and then after that, the states pick up, I think eventually like 6% of that cost. The federal government's still paying for those people about 96% uh, or something close to that. So that alone would save money. You know, you're always going to have differences of opinion in Washington about what, uh, what kinds of changes cost the federal government money and save the federal government money. So you're, you're never going to have Democrats and Republicans in particular on the same page on what things cost. You never have the, the White House has its own budget office, Congress has its own budget office, and then there are a million economists out there and they're all saying what, what this is going to cost, what that's going to cost. And a lot of the cost savings in health reform are, are based on how people are going to behave in the future. Um, the Congressional Budget Office, which is the one that Congress has to pay attention to when it makes its laws, uh, can and can't consider different kinds of changes, and it's a very complicated system. Um, but I'm going to leave it at that. There's so much to talk about on this front. I'm sure my colleagues have other, other points to make on this. I don't want to carry a, a brief for uh, Obamacare. Um, <clears throat> But it, it does have, within the fine print, um, elements that could result in dramatic reductions in costs. And one, one way uh, I put it is, it's, it's like um, on Christmas Day, you come down and there's this, as a kid, and there's this thing that you've been obsessing about, that, this toy that you want, right? And you look under the tree and the package is just the right size and you rip it open, and it is that just thing that you wanted, except that it says some assembly required, right? <laughs> so the some assembly required is is the part about the, the accountable care organizations. There's there's 17 billion dollars in that bill that would enable somebody um, to go out, for example, and create something like a civilian VA. And as Gardner said, this is not rocket science. We, the basic blocking and tackling that's needed to create efficiency and, and quality in health care. You know, we, we know what to do. In the case of the VA, we don't even have to say, some start sentences like, in Sweden they, right? We can just ask your neighbors who use the VA, they'll tell you, right? So it, all, the tools are there, right? But it takes grassroots activism and, and change to, to make good of, of, of that enabling legislation. So. It's not possible for somebody at CBO to say, well, you know, I can just see that this will cost or save that much money. It all depends, as you say, on, 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 on behavior. Um, so I think there, there's, there's hope for the program. What I worry about is, is um, that, that that change won't come fast enough, that health care costs will continue to go up as they have forever, Right, quality will continue to deteriorate as they, it has forever, 
And, and, but now people will say, oh, yeah, that's because the government got into health care even more and it got worse. And a whole new generation will take a new lesson from this and say, oh, my God, we did it wrong. And, and to my progressive friends, you know, I, I, I remind them of a history that's, that's often forgotten about where Medicare came from. Medicare came from people like Wilbur Cohen and other um, long gone progressive activists who, who spent much of the 20th century trying to create universal health care. And then there came a moment in 1965 when the political stars were all lined up, not for universal health care, but maybe we could cover 65 and over universally. Right? So these activists of their generation made this big compromise with themselves. They said, well, we can't have the whole loaf, so we'll, we'll take this half a loaf. And when younger people see what a great thing Medicare is, they'll demand to be included in it too. Right? Well, what happened instead was <clears throat> because Medicare did not address itself at all to the, the actual delivery of health care, right? it only was about paying doctors to do whatever they wanted to do, and in the early days would compensate them for whatever they said where they were owed, right? the price of Medicare went through the roof, right? and it taught a whole generation of liberals, including me, right, that Medicare was something that was really dangerous. Right? You couldn't possibly expand it to the whole population. If you did everything else you wanted in life, whether it was high-speed rail or better preschool or whatever it was, would just get consumed by this thing. Right? So the, the, the real drama of this moment right, is if, if Obamacare does not contain costs, right, a whole new generation will take that lesson and, and we, will, we will go down the Ryan path of just further putting, taking part this entitlement. Um, and that's, that's why it's, it's just all important that we really do get this delivery system form. Also, you mentioned something I think is also, I just like to associate myself with, which is the, the monopolization problem, right? We know from examples like the VA, from Geisinger and others, that a system, an actual integrated system, is it does combine higher quality with lower costs and greater patient satisfaction done right. But if it becomes a monopoly, then the health insurers don't have any leverage over it and they become price takers, right? We don't want that, right? Um, even the VA itself is not a monopoly. Vets have the chance to go someplace else if they don't want to go to the vet. But in many markets now, we have no, no choice as, as, but to go to whatever gigantic um, managed care provider is, is in the market. So this, this, this cause has to be combined with hands-on um, competitiveness policy, right? Monopolization is, is a gigantic thing. And, you know, as is so often the case, there are advantages to monopoly. If, you, if you're a railroad, it's better that your tracks go everywhere than that it only goes some places, right? Steel making is more efficiently done with large concentrations of capital, right? But you always have to balance that against the evils of pure monopoly. So, um, I but think it, that's... But I think, what, this, I mean, one of the reasons why this debate is so hard is that we're not talking about railroads, we're talking about lives. And so what, what, what you often have is this debate between price and, and saving lives, quality. Um, and so uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm so pessimistic, really, about private insurance. And, and I think the private insurers are as well, by the way. You know, mm -hmm. the private insurers are starting to buy providers because right. they know that their private insurance business is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, because once you go into this world where, you, you know, what... what uh, the, the healthcare reform law has essentially done is taken away from insurers what their sort of fundamental tool for making profits, which was underwriting, which was that they would insure healthy people, but they wouldn't insure sick people because sick people were expensive. So the way you could make money in, in health insurance was just to be very good at making sure that you only insured people who wouldn't actually use your services. That, of course, has a fundamental problem from a social point of view, of course, because you actually want sick people to get access to doctors. So, so if, if you change this system, and I think it makes sense to change the system and to sort of 
you get everybody involved so you don't have this <clears throat> issue of underwriting. In other words, you don't have this issue of pushing out sick people from the system and only bringing in people who, who don't, uh, who can't use this or won't use the system like you guys mostly. Um, then you get into sort of the dilemma of health insurers now, which is, okay, well, now that we can't do this, how are we going to make our business? And, and th what they're sort of realizing is the only way to sort of do this is to actually start delivering care more efficiently, getting providers. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I personally don't think we're going to get there. And, and, I, and what's interesting is that I think if, if the Obama administration fails and, and health care reform fails, um, I think to some extent we're going to get to a kind of a tipping point moment sooner than, than not. But I think we're going to get there. At some point, you know, what, I don't know if you all read about what happened in Wisconsin, of course. What happened in Wisconsin was Republican governor wanted to, you know, <clears throat> lower um, the price of providing health care to state employees, which made sense because state employees get <clears throat> a lot richer health care benefits than than sort of private employees. And I think that's a thing that is sweeping across the country. And of course, what what is happening is that the last sort of bastion of people who have very good access to health care are, are, are very soon not going to have very good access to health care. And you know, the reason why we don't have universal health care is that Nixon, who tried to get universal health care, was 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 stopped by the unions because the unions had terrific Cadillac plans and they thought if we had universal health care they their access to these terrific health care uh, networks would sort of decline well I think pretty soon we're going to be in a situation where a vast majority of of the middle class and 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 the working class don't have good access to any health care at all and I think at some point, the vast majority of this country is going to then get to the place that Phil talks about, which is they're going to say, well, wait a second, this sucks. I mean, uh, why am I paying into this so much and getting out so little? And at some point, you know, the international comparisons, frankly, don't matter at all to people. But at some point, some of these comparisons, I think, are going to penetrate. And, you know, if we went to a British system right now, I would get a seven thousand to ten thousand dollar raise it's a lot of money like because that's money that comes out of my salary right now to pay for health care that i think kind of sucks and i really only have one choice in my health care right now i have blue cross blue shield which because of the way the new york times is that's the only choice i really have and in much of this country by the way you know a lot of this country only has one choice as well so i would if we went to a sort of a British style system, I would I would switch from having one choice to having another only one choice. But I would get ten grand. You tell me, like what's wrong with that scenario? And I think at some point people are going to start asking that question. Just why give me the money? And you know, I, since I don't have any choices now, I'll just go to this other thing that I won't have any choices in. 